So the CBC and the Canadian Radio Commission, they coexisted side by side, or did one move no, into the other? No, they didn't. And that's how I lost my show. They didn't want they No, no sponsorship. CBC came in, and I was a bum. I was a star one day, and I was the occasional walk-on the next. At right before the age of 14 or 15. Is this right? I was 11. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Wow, and two fifty a show. Yeah, and a CCM bicycle at the end of the month. This sounds like <laughs> paradise. And what was the atmosphere um, then, in the mid thirties? Then doing a new medium called well, radio. The, there was a great show called Forgotten Footsteps. A man called Rupert Lucas produced it, and every week you would visit some part of the Royal Ontario Museum and tell the story behind a mummy, a Haida statue, a carved thing, you know. It was wonderful. I loved it. Wow. And gradually, uh, people started to filter in from the West. They were called Al Andrew Allen and his Western gentlemen. People like John Draney, Bernie Braden, Fletcher Markle. And I was l lucky enough to be on the kind of B team of that great aggregation. It was our national theater. It was. It, it was really the was. Yeah, we had radio, Canadian radio drama before we had Canadian theatrical drama. Yep. Tommy Thompson, Tommy Andrew Tweed. Allen, Tommy Tweed. Sorry, Tommy Tweed. Yeah. Andrew Allen. You're trying to get a, a, a family member in there. I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of, of that first sort of uh, Canadian theatr theatrical well, acting company. Uh, the, the Easterners that I knew resented strongly these intruders, but the intruders were talented. They did, I mean, they did a, a new play every week. They, and he encouraged, Andrew Allen encouraged more Canadian writers than anybody ever did. It was wonderful. Wow. And when you say they were from the West, Andrew Allen was from... Vancouver or Winnipeg? Or they came from Vancouver. Yeah. From Vancouver. Tommy Tweed was from Winnipeg. Medicine Hat originally, but the whole th it became a national team. Do you think that was maybe the beginning of uh, a sense of the Canadians telling their own story in their yes, own land? Yes, no question. I understand Tony Guthrie came over about 1932 and did something about the CP, the building of the CPR. Tony Guthrie? Tyrone Guthrie? Yep, Tyrone Guthrie. And he came over as a radio producer? A radio producer. Then went home, and to me, there wasn't much after that. There was a, a vaudeville team called Woodhouse and Hawkins. And uh, Johnny Wayne and Frank Schuster were college boys working on CFRB in a thing called the Wife Savers. They were giving hints, but they put jokes in. And of course, eventually, they got a, their own CBC show, Half Hour, and then they went away on the Army show and came back. And the thing that thrilled me was that when I first did Charlie Farquharson in 1952, 10 years after I'd worked for him on a farm, worked I felt- for Charlie. Yeah. You worked for Charlie Well, Parkinson. his name was Charles, but, and, and he didn't speak that funny way. He, but he wore that, this hat and this sweater and these glasses. Near Paris Sound. And I don't think the people were laughing at what I said. They were laughing at the accent. Because Wayne and Schuster were very Jack Benny, you know. Mm -hmm. And the other guys were English. Oh, I don't know. And I, suddenly, my God, that's the way she goes, you know. And I think people said, that's us. That's what. That's the most. That's the biggest thrill I've ever had. Yes, we imported our culture for so long. You know, the touring companies. We're, as you we're say. doing it. We're still doing it. And we're still doing it. Yeah. So the CBC or the Canadian. We're Radio also exporting some wonderful talents. <laughs> if it came back. It's funny, you know, when I when I lived in Hollywood. Any Canadian I met would have give his eye teeth to be back here. Really. That's the fun. Yeah. And your years in Hollywood I'm were... talking about people like Jimmy Carey and, and uh, 
even, I don't know about Mike Myers, but, but uh, uh, Marty Short and, and all the Second City gang, they were happiest in Edmonton. Well, there was nothing to do but, but be creative. Wow. What were your years in Hollywood? Uh, I was there. Um, Catherine Hepburn sent me there. And that was a show you did with her in New York? No, we did a show in Stratford, Connecticut. We did The Merchant of Venice. Right, okay. She came to me when I was doing a show in New York called Separate Tables. And I opened my dressing room door and there it was, that unforgettable face. Actually full of freckles, and, uh, but the bones were all in place. And she said, my name, I said, I know who you are. <laughs> she said, well, I want you to be my boyfriend this summer. I said, really, where? She said, Stratford. I said, I just finished doing Stratford. She said, no, no, not Ontario. Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can And she said, I said, what's the play? She said, the match of the Venice. I said, what, you're playing Portia? Your boyfriend is Bassanio? I just finished playing that in Ontario. Well, you'll play it again, won't you? <laughs> you don't say no to this force of nature. Anyway. And how was that? She, um, she, she, she cried every scene she, uh, and until her boyfriend Spencer Tracy came and told her to, for God's sake, dry up and, and, and just play the comedy, which she did very well. She cried in every scene, meaning oh, yeah. overcome by the angst of it all. Yeah. And, and as, as Guthrie, Toronto Guthrie used to say to us, don't cry. That's the audience's job. Let them do their work. And I've had to tell that to a couple of Matthews in Anne of Green Gables. Don't cry just before you die. Let the audience do it. Anyway. Catherine Hepburn on stage, though. I have never spoken to anyone who actually was on stage with Catherine Hepburn. Well, it's interesting. She said that in the doorway, she said, I know there's a difference in our ages. But when you see me on stage, I shall be five years old. So we're doing the dress rehearsal, and I'm choosing the caskets, and she's helping me. The, the, the little girls are singing, tell me where is fancy bread. And every time the word bread come, head, <laughs> pointing to the casket. <laughs> so I, I turn and say, and seal this bargain with a loving kiss or something. There's Catherine Hepburn jumping up and down like a five-year-old. That was her great gift, that she was a great comedian. But she wanted to be a tragedian. Right. But, but Spencer Tracy would say, shut up. Don't, just. And, and so at the end of the summer, she sent me out there to him. I was going to do a picture with him called 10 North Frederick. But he didn't like the studio head or something, and he, he walked out of it. So I was left high and dry. In Hollywood? Yeah. With an agent, without an agent? Or? No, no. Uh, I got an agent fast. Um, and uh, Lillian Small, her name was. I like female agents. I trust them. And uh, she sent me over to Columbia, and I did a screen test for Joseph and His Brethren, the Thomas Mann novel, with... Um, Victoria, Australian girl, married to Roger Smith, anyway. So uh, while waiting for that, I went to Paramount and did a screen test for them from a wonderful man called George Seaton. And the screen test is one scene, two scenes? One scene. And you did full rehearsal, makeup, costume, yep. mm -hmm. lights. And I did, I, I, I played, oh, I did two things for Paramount. I did. Uh, an Irish uh, rebel of the 19th century. I've forgotten his name. <laughs> and then I did a scene from Peter DeVries' uh, comedy that Johnny Carson later did as a movie. I've forgotten. Anyway, I did that. And so I, they signed me. And? Nothing. Well, <laughs> I did, I, uh, they loaned me out for television shows. They, they, they wouldn't put me in a comedy because they said I had, they, I had a tragic face. Oh, my 
And I said, so does Buster Keaton. So they signed you to one-year contract, five-year contract? They thought I was a young Montgomery Clift. Seven-year contract. Seven years. 750 bucks a week. Rain or shine. And did you film? You filmed on television, and you were no. Like I, 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 um, I never did a film for Paramount. Strange arrangement. Well, they did a lot of people there hanging around doing nothing. That's why they, you know, they go to pot, they drink, and all that sort of stuff. Right. Now I was busy writing. I was writing a play for Stratford, Ontario. Now, if Charlie had gone to Hollywood, what would that have been that's like? Interesting if he you sat Charlie that. down and said, OK, I'm going that's to give you. That's interesting you say that, because a couple of years later, I was up for a part at Desilu. We were doing the trial of Samuel Mudd. He was the doctor who fixed up John Wilkes Booth's broken leg. And I was auditioning for the part of John Wilkes Booth. And I got it because of my piercing eyes, they tell me. But the guy, guy said, look, I don't know your work, but uh, I remember seeing your father on television. He met Charlie Farkas. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. But Charlie never made it to Hollywood. 